is episode 87, recorded on March 27, 2020. C3PO or R2D2 from Zanata Consulting. I'm Brett Martin. And I'm Tyler Colt. And let's get right on into the news. We have a fair amount to talk about uh, this week. We'll start with Zoho Expense, now integrates into Zoho Projects. This is kind of interesting. You know, for the longest time, people have wanted to accurately track inside of a project the expense and overall profitability. You can kind of do it around the project budget side, but it's not been great. This was only released a couple of days ago, so I really haven't had a chance to play with it. I don't know if the integration of Zoho Expense into project is going to give some more functionality to, to that or not, but it's definitely something that's been asked for for a while. Yeah, and I think with a lot of people using the Zoho Finance integration, right, where you're actually tracking time and then invoicing out for that time all through projects, being able to actually go in and track your expenses as well kind of helps to complete that loop. So I would imagine that a decent amount of people will be using it just because it would be a pretty cool tool to be able to centralize, you know, your revenue from invoicing, your costs from tracking your time, right, with all the timesheets that are already in there, and then any of your extraneous costs like travel expenses or materials that you're buying, all just kind of routing in to get, you know, a total profitability of a project. So it's cool to see them kind of leveraging the fact that they have a whole finance suite that can play right into that project management suite there. And I'd see... I'd, I'd expect that we'll see some people pick up this integration and start to play with it. Yeah, I think so. Um, we'll, we'll do it ourselves here, hopefully, over the next uh, week or so. Hey, and then we'll kind of move on. Uh, Zoho Forms is now adding PayPal Checkout as a new payment gateway. Uh, you may think, oh, PayPal Checkout's already there, but uh, the thing with Zoho is these payment gateways don't necessarily are not necessarily in every single application they have. So sometimes you'll you'll open up one of the finance suite like subscriptions, and there'll be a payment gateway that's not inside checkout or something that's not inside books and you've got all these disparate things. That's the case here with Zoho Forms, but they've now added uh, PayPal checkout. And uh, we were talking about it a little earlier, it's a, it's a pretty big deal from a conversion aspect. Yeah, and basically the difference here, you know, you may be thinking, well, couldn't I already take PayPal payments through a form? And you could, but it was through the default PayPal integration. And, and that basically works where they click to pay and it actually routes them to the PayPal website, right? They complete the payment there. Whereas PayPal checkout, you can actually have them submit the, all of the payment directly there on the form on that same URL without having a redirect. And so those couple extra steps, right, of not having to pop onto another website to finish the transaction is definitely gonna convert you more sales. PayPal Checkout is claiming 82% better conversion, which would be incredible. Um, so I'd be, be surprised if it's that effective, but it's definitely more effective at closing those sales if you're asking people to make less clicks. Yeah, I would never uh, never use regular PayPal if, with with a conversion rate that's you know five to one. That's uh, that's pretty good. So, anyway, nice to see that they continue to add various payment gateways. And Zoho Forms is getting more and more powerful uh, with the things it can do. It's got all the sign integration now, payment integration. There's just a there's a lot going on there. And you know, the ability to accept payments in Zoho is everywhere. I mean, I was looking at Showtime the other day. You can actually charge inside Showtime for your training sessions. And these, so these gateways are you know, super important. And uh, PayPal is one of the big ones. So good stuff there. Also, this is kind of cool, but uh, Zoho Show gets uh, some Giphy integration. Uh, and I played around with this a little bit. And I have to say, I like it a lot. You know, you can do, uh, I think sometimes these can be distracting, but it uh, it's just seamless little integration. So when you click to add an image into your into Zoho Show, which is that's their PowerPoint, if you will, um, it just very very seamlessly goes ahead and you know gives you the choice. You do a search and you've got all these little basically animated gifs that you can go ahead and choose from and drop directly into your presentation. I think a lot of them are cheesy. But you'll notice in their demo, they kind of show you some that aren't necessarily cheesy and some that actually might in, add some some nice touches to your overall presentation. Yeah, and maybe every now and then if it's an internal presentation or something for your team, maybe a little bit of cheesy isn't the worst thing in the world. But I mean, the big, big thing is this almost reminds me of the Unsplash integration that they did across a bunch of different applications, right? Where 
Unsplash is a service that has um, a bunch of free images for you to use in presentations and media. And a couple, would it be a couple months ago now, they rolled out a, a bunch of Unsplash integrations for show and showtime and all these different tools. And it's kind of similar to that where they're basically just providing you a bunch of content on deck to be able to drop into, you know, whatever you may be using for your presentation. So it's really nice, really easy. Uh, Brett, if you're watching us on video right now on YouTube, he's actually inside of a Zoho show document here, kind of playing around and showing you the UI. So it's really easy to basically just add these right in. The big question is though, is it GIF or GIF? That is always the eternal question. And I won't state my opinion out there because um, I don't want to get crucified, but that's a hot debate out in the world of the internet. I've always been a GIF person, always, but I, I don't know, I, I, and I, I'm not sure it matters. But you know, the point is they've got them both here. It's not loading uh, very well right now. I, I un, unsplash loads, but basically, when you click on an image, you now have all of these various choices. You can upload an image from your library, from a URL. You can search for it. You can do it from uh, Giphy. You can do it from Unsplash. Uh, there's a whole variety of uh, different things you can do. Um, and I will say, if you're watching this, this is being recorded during the middle of the coronavirus epidemic, and uh, everybody's working from home, and the internet's a bit of a disaster. So probably not, uh, probably not Zoho's problem that that's not loading right there. But uh, it's really simple to get to, and I think you'll, you know, if you if you play around with it, it's uh, it's pretty nice. Pretty nice. It's a nice addition. They've been doing a lot with uh, with show lately. I've noticed. Yeah, it seems like they're across their whole office suite, right? With the fact that they dropped in the pick lists into Zoho Sheet not too long ago, it seems like they really are trying to expand a lot of the functionality there of the office suite that they've got. And moving on in the news, you know, if you know Excel and if you're a spreadsheet guru, then pivot tables. They do something for you, and uh, Zoho <laughs> Zoho has taken pivot tables with a really really nice update inside of Zoho Sheet. Uh, basically, now when you go ahead and you're making a change in a pivot table, it's auto refreshing for you, so you don't need to do the re the refresh. You basically it's keeping up with you. So as you're you know adding adding data in, it's 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 the pivot tables keeping up, and it's. Uh, it's nice because normally you are constantly having to do a refresh, you know, um, every time, every time you made, you know, change to the overall structure, uh, you'd have to go in and just refresh that page. So it's pretty nice. Yeah. More and more improvements. It seems like every week or two across all those different applications, you know, with all the different embeds they rolled out that you can do in writer, to the pick list update for Sheet, and now they improved pivot tables, and they've got more and more integrations for show to help you bring in all this content. It seems like they're really doubling down on fleshing out a lot of those kind of standard Office Suite applications. Yeah, they truly are. They truly are, and it's uh, it's some good stuff. But that that's kind of nice. And I mean, pivot tables, you really got to be into your uh, into your spreadsheets to start to use those. They're not necessarily they're not that difficult, but you don't see them. They're not for the faint of heart, I should say, but uh, that's a nice improvement if you're using them. And boy, speaking of COVID-19, and I think if I got, I, I'm going to suggest that uh, you probably as a business don't need to send out a COVID-19 email to your clients and customers unless it truly directly <laughs> affects them. But uh, Zoho in Zoho Campaigns has now added a whole bunch of COVID-19 templates. So if you do want to communicate uh, and tell everybody something that I would hope they know by now, which is best practices, how to wash your hands, social distancing, all of those kind of things, well, uh, there's just a whole bunch of, uh, of COVID-19 templates in there that you can go ahead and choose and send to your customers, and they can add that into the uh, 50 other coronavirus emails they got during the day as well. <laughs> so, but uh, more nice, more nice templates for you there. I don't know. You got anything on that, Tyler? No, nothing for me. All right, and then the last little bit of news here um, is uh, WorkDrive, because everybody's working from home, and this is really nice. Uh, WorkDrive has increased the uh, storage on their plans. 
Yeah, and so I think this is uh, something they're pretty much just doing out of the kindness of their heart, it seems like, right, where they're basically upping the storage significantly um, for all of their different users, right? So before on the starter plan, you would receive 100 gigs of storage. They've upped that to one terabyte, so 10 times the storage that you get with your work drive account. Um, so that's a really, really, really significant increase. I think you'd be hard pressed to really use a full terabyte if you're working on spreadsheets and PowerPoints and all of your standard documents like that. So really nice thing for them to do to just make it a little bit easier and um, simpler for people to work remote without worrying about their storage capacity. Yeah, and then they've dumped, if you're on the team plan, uh, which the whole one, you basically are going from a terabyte to three terabytes. And they're not saying that this is uh, this is temporary. This is not like, oh, by the way, on July 31st, we're going to lower everybody's storage limits back down. This appears to be a uh, a permanent upgrade to the storage that you're getting inside of WorkDrive, and that's huge. Like you said, I mean, this is, these are massive increases. So um, I think that'll pretty much take care of everybody else. And then uh, you also get an additional 300 gigabytes for every new user you add into your team plan as well. So after you get above 10 users, so that's uh, that's significant. So you're 300 gigabytes per user on the team plan basically across the board. Good stuff. So both on iOS and Android. So if you're unfamiliar with layout rules, both in desk and in the CRM, you actually have the ability to say, I want to hide all of these fields, say say you're, the, the example they're, they're giving here is, um, if the service, service name is Zoho Desk, then I wanna show what the issue was and I wanna show what the question is and I wanna put in whatever a feature request would be. Um, but if the service name is not that, then I don't even need to show those fields. So what this is is kind of conditional layout showing, if if the field if this field is checked, then show these five other fields. If it's not checked, then don't show those five fields. So these layout rules are very powerful, and they really declutter your interface, especially on the CRM. I find you know some you can do some really 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 cool things in the CRM with with layout rules. And oftentimes people are doing their own layouts, which is different. And that's where the whole layout's completely different. It's not conditional at all. But inside those layouts, you can have all of these conditional layout rules. Well, they've now extended that to mobile on the desk side. Super, super nice. There's a nice little tutorial they give you on how to do that. And I'm glad they rolled it out to both iOS and Android at the same time. That's really big. They haven't been doing that a lot lately. So uh, happy to see that as well. Yeah. And layout rules, like you're saying, are just super nice because the less, less is more when it comes to fields on a screen, right? You really don't want to show people a bunch of things that they don't need to fill out you know, based on what they're working on. So super nice to be able to roll this out with the mobile, especially just because so many people are doing work that way nowadays. Um, so really any functionality that comes to the browser really shouldn't be far behind on mobile devices. All right, so let's move on to our implementation of the week. What do you have for us this week, Tyler? Yes, this week we've got an implementation around the deals module that'll basically help you track and sort your deals based on the next activity that you have planned for that deal. And that's when we're talking about an event or a call or a task with a due date. So for those watching us on YouTube, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up a screen here in one of our little demo accounts. And I've got a couple deals up on the screen. And we'll see that for example one, right? We don't have any activities planned for it. There's no little flag over here on the far left. Whereas for activity, or for our example deal two, we do have this task and this activity date. And so this actually was something that was requested by a client because at their company, they expect their sales reps to have some type of open activity for every single deal, right? And then they wanna be able to help those sales reps sort these deals by that next activity date. And so the way that this works is basically that you know, if you're working inside of one of your deals and you go ahead and create an activity. So for sake of conversation, let's say we're gonna create a task here. And any task is always gonna have a due date, right? And so we'll say that the due date for a task could be something like April 1st. And so now we'll see we have this task with a due date. And originally, right, we don't have a next activity date. But once that task is completed, that next activity date will actually get filled in. 
Right, and so the goal here though is not just a simple fill, but what if you know you have multiple activities that are scheduled at once? All right, so for example, let's say we had another task that was gonna be due on the 30th of March, so before that first task that we put in there for the 1st of April. And so if I go ahead and create a new task with the due date of April 31st, it'll actually go ahead and update our next activity date to that date on March 30th. And then last but not least here, you know, if you were to create a task for out in the future, right, and let's say we had a task for the 10th of April, so kind of out past when these other tasks are gonna be due, we'll notice that that will actually not overwrite our next activity date because it is further out into the future than either of the two tasks that are created before it. Um, the kind of last little piece here is that if you go ahead and complete a task, so let's say this task for March 30th is completed. So now the next task that's due is gonna be due on April 1st, and we can actually see that the next activity date updates to that task. So it'll basically keep referencing our open activities list every time that an update is made to any record in that list, whether it's a task, event, or call, and basically keep everything straight for you. So now if we look at it from the list view, we can see that we have these flags, which are showing you know, what's due and what's overdue. So both these were in the green, right? Because these are due in the future. And then we're able to sort based on this next activity date to basically give you a quick view to see in order, right? What are the dates that need, or what are the deals that need a touch um, the soonest? So it's kind of a way to just create yourself a useful little view um, where you can, in essence, sort by the due date or start date of your next activity for a deal. Yeah, and I think one thing kind of didn't show here that's important to note is because you say, well, why don't I just put the due date as a field and we sort by that? Uh, because they're different. So if, if you have an actual task, that's a different field than it is for an event and a different field than it is for a call. So this is actually pulling off those three disparate fields, looking at the most current one and populating it there. And if you don't yeah, have so a task, it's... Go ahead. go ahead. No, that's fine. So yeah, you do bring up a good point that you could look inside the activities module and sort there. And you know, you could even write a script that says, you know, maybe we make a general activity date field, right? And we take the due date from a task and the start date of an event, and we write both of those and kind of consolidate it. Then you could sort your activities by that field, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the big advantage of this is that you're still looking at deals, right? So you're still able to quickly reference the amount and the stage and your anticipated closing date. Whereas if you go the route of tracking all of this inside of activities, you just lose some of the rest of this information from your deal pipeline. Very cool, excellent stuff. All right, so let's now move on to some uh, things we've noticed. Let's do it. So this is kind of an interesting one here. Um, if you have early access and some partners do and actually some actual users do, they've had a, a feature under process management where you've got blueprints and workflows and other things called orchestration and it's now called c3 um but we don't know why <laughs> we've been trying to figure this out for life as a c3po r2d2 what the heck is it because it's just it's just crazy that you've got I, I just have got no explanation at all. And I'm wondering, does this mean Orkesley, which has always been a, a kind of a, an odd name, is that going to be changed to C3? And is it C cubed? What is it, Tyler? Yeah, I almost think, so to kind of step back, so basically the, the blueprints that are in process management, right, are like controlling a process inside of one record, so around a deal. And this orchestration came out, which basically does the same thing, but across multiple different records. So maybe a deal, a contact, and an account are all part of this grand plan that you've designed out. And then Orkesly is a separate application in and of itself, which is basically for like structured approval processes and blueprinting company-wide processes. And 
they rolled out this orchestration inside of the CRM. And I think that for a lot of people, it was a little confusing because, you know, is this an extension of Orkestly? Is this something that's a standalone now tool inside of the CRM? So I think they probably renamed it to keep it clear, right? Between Orkestly being over here and this tool in the CRM not being the same, right? So they didn't want to have the same name. But the mystery of C3 eludes me. I'm thinking, could it be an acronym? Could it be just something that they put as a placeholder? I don't know. <laughs> Not quite sure, I'm... but we haven't heard any justification for the name quite yet on our end. <laughs> I'm, isn't that an explosive or is that C2? Um, <laughs> I think that's C4. Um... A C4. Oh, great. I'm never really up on my plastic explosives. I need to, I need to <laughs> polish up on that. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to this week's read. So uh, this is over at Customer Think, which we haven't gone to in a while. And I really liked this article. It's by a Patricia Jones, and she works for Converge Hub. She's a CRM uh, product manager over there. And Converge Hub actually is another CRM. I, quite frankly, I hadn't heard of it. I looked at it. it seems pretty interesting. But she did an, uh, a, a guest piece over here at Customer Think, and it's called Remodel Your Sales Strategy with Uncomfortable but Effective Sales Cadence for Growth. And the interesting part about this is that she's really just saying slow down the overall sales cadence because today there seems to be a mad rush to just constantly, you know, bombard your clients with information and phone calls and text messages and emails. And she makes a compelling case for it. But the part of this article that I really, really liked was not necessarily um, the slowdown, but where she talks about you know, what's truly, truly important. And it's the whole, you know, understand your client, you know, establish your next logical steps, share something interesting, plan all of your questions, you know, and how it takes a lot of time to properly sell someone because you do need to get into their head. You need to understand their business. You need to understand what their pain points are. And I know that this can be uh, maybe a rather, uh, maybe it seems rather obvious, but she did a really nice job laying this out and uh, I just thought I would, uh, I'd, I'd point that out. So pretty good article. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that this article does well is it's easy to fall into the trap. You know, when you're empowered by a CRM, you can move really quickly as a salesperson. But it doesn't mean that, you know, calling someone every day just to call them is a good idea, right? And that's kind of part of where it's talking about making a plan, knowing what you're going to ask someone. Don't just call them to call them. Call them with a specific question or call them with a specific solution to something they mentioned on a previous call. Because the more times that you call someone with nothing really to say, the more likely it is they're going to start filtering your calls out, right? And that's where you don't want to end up. It's a similar thing almost with um, you know email marketing. Like too many emails gets you filtered, right? So when, if right. a company sends me one email a month or one every other month, I generally won't unsubscribe. But if I get two in a week, they're probably getting filtered at to spam on my end. So right. I think it's part of that kind of idea of do things with intent, not just doing them to do them. Right. Relevant content, relevant messaging, relevant communication, whether it's in sales, whether it's in marketing and anything, I think you, you just, you got to make it relevant. And uh, I think people really, people really appreciate that at the end of the day. Uh, anyway, nice article and uh, really good job there, Patricia. All right. So let us move on. So I've kind of broken this week's reads. I made it this week's read. And now I've got a whole new section here that you'll see in the newsletter in the show called New on Zanata because we have really, really, really stepped up our content. And I think we're doing a good job, Tyler, of making it relevant. So I just wanted to uh, actually start to highlight all of the different content that we posted up on Zanata this week. So every week there is this show. This drops on Monday. And every Monday, the, all the show notes, uh, which is basically the newsletter that goes out, as well as links to the uh, audio and the video version of the CRM Zen Show are posted up there. And then in our blogs, we've actually been breaking out relevant content out of various things we're doing. So uh, this week, we did our uh, Zoho Campaigns Overview and Best Practices webinar, Tyler, which was a lot of fun. Um, we had a, a issue with our recording, so we actually got to do it twice in one day. So, and I was told by uh, 
the, uh, our producer that the second version that we did was much, much better. So I guess those of you who missed the webinar, that can now uh, go ahead and watch the replay on YouTube. Uh, I hear it's much more concise and, uh, and a better version of what we did before. Uh, but we covered a whole lot on there and we'll be doing some breakouts on that as well. But that was really well, really well attended. I think we had 60 people show up for that, 140 registered and so uh, good stuff. Uh, and then we've got some, uh, some things kind of from, that we've had like our tips and tricks of the week and our implementation of the week and our app of the week we're actually breaking those out as separate content because oftentimes there are people who just don't get a chance to listen to the entire show or they don't watch the entire show and we actually kind of go into a little more detail on these things um, now that we're doing the video show we're actually kind of showing them these presentation so we're we're breaking that out as well so this week we've got a how to customize your zoho homepage, which was from last week's show and our application of the week from last week's show which was uh power tools by able bits which is a a spreadsheet um, tool that allows you to do all sorts of really, really quick down and dirty formatting and cleanup of your spreadsheets. And then our resource library is now fully baked. I am really happy to say that this is launched um, and we will be adding a lot of con to it, the content to it. The goal is to add three to five pieces of content to this resource library on a weekly basis. Uh, this week, we've just got one because we actually kind of just really got it ramped up with all the other stuff was there. So we, we've got something on Zoho Social. It's a product overview. Now, this is a PowerPoint presentation that was given at Zoholics a few years ago, but it's got some really relevant information in it, and it's one of the best ones we found. So that's kind of up there as well. So if you uh, go, uh, go to our main website and you'll see right up at the very top, you're going to see resources and just click on that. And we have all of the resources around every single thing you might want to see. So if you hover over sales and marketing, you can uh, you can go into CRM, and then inside CRM, it's going to tell you all the you know all the resources. There's 27 articles. There's five guides. There's 16 videos. So you can kind of drill down to each one of these little categories. You can search them, see what you're looking for. So we spent a lot of time in this, and hopefully you find it uh, useful and helpful. And we're really going to drive on this. So every week there should be a whole bunch of content going out. Yep. As we always preach it when we talk about, um, you know, email marketing or any type of marketing content, right? Generally coming from customer think or one of our, you know, week's reads that it's all just about putting out useful and relevant content. So we're trying to uh, practice what we preach here and contribute a lot of uh, free information out there. There you go. All right, and now we're going to move on to our application of the week. So I love this application. Uh, we stumbled across it earlier uh, earlier last week. I came across this it's called Soapbox, and this is a very down and dirty meeting agenda software. It allows you to set an agenda. It allows you to have uh, integrated meeting notes, real-time commenting, questions ahead of the meeting, next steps you can rate you can actually people can rate the meeting was this a good meeting we had or a bad meeting we love the google calendar integration and i'll kind of show you that here if those of you that are watching on video but if you have a g suite and you use google calendar when you create an agenda and i'm hovering over the crm zen show right now it gives you a little uh indication that there is an agenda for it in the corner of the invite and here's the agenda for the show. So we have been very challenged uh, since the whole world is working at home. So we had to test the internet. Uh, we had to retest the internet. And then of course we had to figure out what C3 stands for, but we never could. That was the big agenda for the show. But you can see the power of this and you can share this with people. Uh, people can make suggestions. When it's done, you can email the final agenda and all the notes to all of your attendees. Uh, it was just a surprising little application and one that, uh, you know, there's a lot of overlap, I guess, in, in things that Zoho has. But, you know, oftentimes you're just looking for this really, really clean efficiency where you're just in one spot and you kind of want everything to be there. And when you're doing meetings, you're launching go to meeting, you're in the calendar. And it's kind of nice because you can send this agenda out to everybody ahead of time and share it with them. And anyway, I, I found it to be really useful super cheap it also integrates with slack outlook microsoft teams it has ios and android applications when you get to six users it's uh twelve dollars per month so that's two dollars per user up to that point it's five dollars their pricing's a little weird um so at five users i think you're still at five dollars a month 
<laughs> and then when you get to the six, it goes up, and then it seems to go up in two dollar increments. Uh, but a really uh, a really great application. It's uh, Soapbox. We've got the link in the show show notes. It's SoapboxHQ.com, and I uh, recommend you give it a shot. What do you think of it, Tyler? I think it's great. I mean, the as you kind of touched on earlier, it's just simple, you know, and it, you can just easily integrate it with G Suite, easily integrate it with your Google Calendar, and then just drop everything in. And so, you know, it's you'll definitely you'll need the people that are attending the meeting to have licenses. So I'd say it's more useful for an internal tool rather than a tool for your clients, right? That being said, if you're having a client meeting, it wouldn't hurt to make yourself an agenda, right? If you've got five meetings lined up in a day and you're starting to get wires crossed, you know, what am I talking to this person about, right? If you're diligent and create yourself an agenda for every meeting, it's definitely going to help. Um, but for any of those internal meetings, right, just being able to quickly and easily add an agenda, take suggestions from everyone else, right? Take ratings on the meeting, right? Which I think is big for a lot of people that may suffer from, you know, meeting overload, right? Being able to say, you know what? I don't think we needed this. This could have been an email, right? So being able to give some feedback from your team about how meetings went. So I think overall, it's just a great tool and one that we're definitely going to be using uh, internally at Sonata. Yeah. And by the way, I figured out the pricing. I just kind of got to scroll down the page a little bit on the pricing. So it's $5 for your first five users. And then it's uh, $7 per user per month after the five users so if you go to six users it goes to 12. so you kind of increment up there and that's if you pay monthly it looks like they're giving you uh i don't know what the discount is here it looks like 20 yeah, percent off for annual 20 20 percent discount if you pay annually so take 20 percent off of that anyway i found it to be really really useful so far we're definitely going to buy it um and play around with it and kind of integrate it in our day-to-day -day. so uh, i'm finding it's keeping us uh, pretty organized and you know it's over just it's just 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 nifty little application Okay, so let us now move on to our tip and trick of the week. Um, we're going to make this real quick, but this is scoring rules. And Tyler, it seems like we don't run into this too often, but when we do, it's such an important thing. Yeah, so scoring rules are basically a way in the CRM to, you know, give or subtract points, right, from a lead or a contact or now an accountant deal, as Brett's going to talk about. Um, based on different actions, right? So if you're sending out emails out of the CRM, like workflow, kind of automated, lightweight marketing emails, or maybe you have um, outreach sales reps kind of placing calls, right? As long as everything's being tracked in the CRM, you can actually score on this. And, and at the end of the day, the benefit is, let's say we send three emails to 100 leads and 10 of them click all three. If we score on that action, right, then we can prioritize our time and focusing on those 10 leads who are engaged. So it's basically a way to score the engagement based on various activities that you're able to track as a prioritization. Yeah, kind of, yeah we'll talk through it here in a kind of a little bit more detail. So if you, you click on settings and then under automation, you're going to see scoring rules. And once you get into the whole scoring rule section, the more things you have integrated with the CRM, the more things you're going to see that you can score on. So on a base implementation, it's very limited. It's really, you know, you can score on a particular lead field or maybe on uh, some email insights or something like that. Basically, have they open or clicked on an email? As you add things in like telephony integration, surveys, campaigns, Facebook, Twitter, social integration, Zoho signs, Zoho backstage, webinar integration, you then can start scoring on all of these things. So what, what does that mean? So you, just as Tyler was saying, the more engaged a client is with you, the higher the score. By the way, you can also take off scores from people. So if a person never, ever, ever opens an email you send them, maybe for every email that's gone unopened, it's just a minus one because there's just absolutely no interest in anything you've sent them. But if they do open one of your emails, maybe that's a plus 10. And then from there, you can trigger overall workflows that say, guess what? This person has finally got to a 15. And at that point, you know that they must be a hot lead because they've clicked on enough things. They've gone to enough websites. They've engaged with you in some sort of a way that now you know that they're that they're important. Uh, and also there are things like if you use acuity scheduling, it'll even know when they book a meeting with you. So if someone books an online meeting with you, they can score it that way as well. And you can do this for leads, you can do this for contacts, 
same kind of thing, because maybe a contact's not necessarily a client, but you always want to kind of monitor that overall level of engagement. Um, and now recently, and as we were doing this, I actually, this may have been here for a long time, but we've never really done anything with it before. Um, you can do it for accounts and, and deals. So in this case, though, you're really making up your own rules. You're saying, you're doing it on a field level basis. So you're saying, hey, if this particular field is X, Y, and Z, then I want to give this particular score. Um, so, you know, as you're in a deal, maybe there are certain things you want to progress through um, to say whether or not this deal's reached a certain level of activity. Because some people, they open a deal at the very beginning. It's almost, you know, as soon as they talk to a lead, it becomes a deal. So that's still not necessarily something that's maybe near closing. So you maybe really want to monitor that uh, very you know, very closely as well. So scoring rules, super important. If you haven't played around with them, I, I really uh, I really suggest you do. Make sure you add workflows then, and it's a very simple workflow. If the score gets to X, then, you know, trigger a, at least something that says, by the way, this person finally reached this score. Uh, so you don't mm -hmm. miss any of the advantages of actually having scoring rules. Yeah, exactly. So something like a task, or you know, notification to a sales rep once that lead hits a certain scores. It's always nice to have, just because if you're gonna put the scoring rules into place, you wanna be able to be notified so you can capitalize on that engagement. All right, Tyler, <laughs> and that is a wrap. Uh, if you've got questions or comments, you can send them over to us at info at zanata.com, or you can just head over to zanata.com and drop us a line. And as always, on the website is where you'll find complete episodes as well as show notes to all the stories that we discussed today. You can also follow us on your favorite social media platform and subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app as well as on YouTube for tons of videos of little tips and tricks as well as full podcast and webinar recordings. Everyone have a great week and uh, we will see you next Monday. Bye-bye, everybody.